how in assembly theory we talk about the four universes, the assembly universe, the assembly possible, and the assembly contingent, and then the assembly observed. And they're all all scales in this combinatorial universe. Yeah. Can you explain each one of them? Yep. So the assembly universe is like anything goes, just it's just combinatorial kind of explosion in everything. So that's the biggest one? That's the biggest one. It's massive. Assembly universe, assembly possible, assembly contingent, and assembly, assembly observed. observed. Yeah. And uh, on the y-axis is assembly steps in time. Yeah. And, you know, in the x-axis, as, as the thing expands through time, more and more unique objects appear. So, yeah, so assembly universe, everything goes. Yep. Um, assembly possible, laws of physics come in, in this case in chemistry bonds. Mm -hmm. In assembly, so that means... Those are actually constraints, I guess? Yes, and they're the only constraints. They're the constraints at the base. So the way to look at it is you've got all your atoms, they're quantized, and you can just bung them together. So then you can become a kind of... So in the way in computer science speak, I suppose the assembly universe is just like no laws of physics. Things can fly through mountains beyond the speed of light. In in the assembly possible, you have to apply the laws of physics, but you can get access to all the motifs instantaneously with no effort. So that means you could make anything. Mm -hmm. Then the assembly contingent says, no, you can't have access to the highly assembled object in the future until you've done the work in the past on the causal chain. And that's really the really interesting shift where you go from assembly um, possible to assembly contingent. That is really the key thing in assembly theory that says you cannot just have instantaneous access to all those memories. You have to have done the work somehow. The universe has to have somehow built a, um, a system that allows you to select that path um, rather than other paths. And then the final thing, the assembly observed is basically us saying, oh, these are the things we actually see. We can go backwards now and understand that they have been created by this, this causal process. Wait, wait a minute. So when you say the universe has to construct a system that does the work, is that like the environment that, that, that allows for like selection? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so that's could, the thing that does the selection. You could think about it in terms of a von Neumann constructor versus a selection, a ribosome, a Tesla plant assembling Teslas. You know, the, the difference between the assembly universe in Tesla land and the, the, the Tesla factory is everyone says, no, Teslas are just easy. They just spring out. You know how to make them all. The Tesla factory, you have to put things in sequence mm -hmm. and out comes a Tesla. So you're talking about the factory. Yes, this is this is really nice. Super important point is that when I talk about the universe having a memory or there's some magic, it's not that. It's that tells you that there must be a process encoded somewhere mm -hmm. in physical reality, be it a cell, a Tesla factory, or something else that is making that object. I'm not saying there's some kind of woo-woo memory in the universe, you know, morphic resonance or something. I'm saying that there is an actual causal process that is being directed constrained in some way um so it's not kind of uh, just making everything yeah but lee what's the factory they made the factory so what what is the so first of all you assume the laws of physics is uh just sprung to, mm -hmm. to existence at the beginning those are constraints but what what makes the factory the environment that does the selection this is the question of well it's the first interesting question that i want to answer out of four i think the factory emerges in the environment the interplay between the environment and the objects that are being built mm -hmm. and and here let me i'll have a go at explaining to you the, the shortest path so why is the shortest path important imagine you've got um, I'm going to have to go chemistry for a moment, then abstract it. Um, so imagine you've got uh, an a given environment that um, that you have a budget of atoms you're just flinging together. Yep. And the the objective of those atoms that are being flung together in, say, molecule A, um, have to make that they have a, they decompose. So molecules decompose over time. So the molecules um, in this environment, in this magic environment, have to not die. But they do die. There's a, there's a, they have a half-life. So the only way the molecules can get through that environment out the other side, let's pretend the environment is a box. We can go in and out without dying. And there's, a, there's just an infinite supply of atoms coming, or, a, well, a large supply. The, the molecule gets built, but the molecule that ha is able to template itself being built mm -hmm. 
um, and survives in the environment will will basically reign supreme. Now, let's say that it, that molecule takes ten steps. Now, and it uh, and it's using a finite set of atoms, right? Or uh, now, let's say another molecule, smart ass molecule, we'll call it, comes in yeah. and can survive in that environment and can copy itself, but it only needs five steps. The molecule that only needs five steps, because it's continued, both molecules are being destroyed, but they're creating themselves faster they can be destroyed. You can see that the shortest path reigns supreme. Mm -hmm. So the shortest path tells us something super interesting about the minimal amount of uh, information required to propagate that motif in time and space. Um, and it's just like a kind of, it seems to be like some kind of conservation law. So uh, one of the intuitions you have is the propagation of motifs in time will be done by the things that can construct themselves in, sh in the shortest t path. Yeah. So like, you can assume that most of the objects in the universe are built in the shortest, in the most efficient way. The, the, huh. so. <laughs> big leap I just took there. Yeah, no, y y y yes and no, because there are other things. So in the limit, yes, because you want to tell the difference between things that have required a factory to build them and just random processes. Mm -hmm. um, but you can find instances where the shortest path isn't taken for an individual object, an individual function. Mm -hmm. um, and people go, ah, that means the shortest path isn't right. And then I say, well, I don't know. I think it's right still. because So, of course, because there are other driving forces. It's not just one molecule. Now, when you start to, now you start to consider two objects, you have mm -hmm. a joint assembly space. And it's not, now it's a compromise between not just making A and B in the shortest path, you want to make A and B in the shortest path, which might mean that A is slightly longer. You have a compromise. Mm -hmm. So when you see slightly more nesting in the construction, when you take a given object, that can look longer, but that's because the overall function is the object is still trying to be efficient. Yeah. And th this is still yeah. very hand wavy. Um, and maybe have no leg to stand on. But we think we're getting somewhere with that. And there's probably some parallelization. Yeah. Right? So this is all, this is not sequential. The building is, yeah, I, I guess. No, when you're you, right. When you're, when you're talking about complex objects, you, you don't have to work sequentially. You can work in parallel. You can get your friends together and they can. Yeah. These And the, the, the thing we're working on right now is how to understand these parallel processes. Now there's an, in, a new thing we've introduced called assembly depth. And assembly depth can be lower than the assembly index for a molecule when they're cooperating together because exactly this parallel processing is going on. Mm -hmm. And my team have been working this out in the last few weeks because we're looking at what compromises does nature need to make when it's making molecules in a cell. And I, I wonder if, you know, I, I may be like, well, I'm always leaping out of um, my competence. <laughs> <laughs> but in economics, I'm just wondering if you could apply this in economic process. It seems like capitalism is very good at finding the shortest path, mm -hmm. you know, every time. But there are ludicrous things that happen because actually the cost function has been minimized. And so I keep seeing parallels everywhere where there are complex nested systems where if you give it enough time and you introduce a bit of heterogeneity, the system readjusts and finds a new shortest path. But the shortest path isn't fixed on just one molecule now. It's in the actual existence of the object over time and that object could be a city it could be a cell it could be a factory but i think we're going way beyond molecules and, and my competence probably should go back to molecules but hey